the focus of this message, and that probably is the right word for it, I do biographies to preach, not out of any mere historical or academic interest alone. The focus of this message on Hudson Taylor is how he experienced union with Christ. Could focus on many other things in his life, but that's what this message is about. And of course, that raises warning flags because many people know that he was deeply influenced by the Keswick movement, and in its worst expressions, there are deep flaws in the Keswick understanding of the Christian life and sanctification in particular, and my conclusion is going to be that Hudson Taylor was not one of those worst examples, but in fact was protected from being one of the bad examples by his allegiance to the Bible, his devotion to the sovereignty of God, and his lifelong experience of suffering. So that's where we're going, which means that there are glorious things to be learned from the life of Hudson Taylor, wonderful lessons about abiding in Christ, about faith, about prayer, about obedience, about sacrifice, about self-denial. Whatever else Keswick's teaching may have gotten wrong, it was not wrong to say to all Christians everywhere, there is more joy, more peace, more love, more power, more fruit to be enjoyed than you are presently enjoying. First Thessalonians 4.1, as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, do so more and more. 1 Thessalonians 4.10, concerning brotherly love, we urge you, brothers, do this more and more. Philippians 1.9, it is my prayer to God that your love may abound more and more. Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Holy Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody to the Lord from your heart. Just on a scale of one to ten, how are you doing with that one? So full of the Holy Spirit that from your heart you are singing and making melody to one another in your family. There is more. There is more. Or Ephesians 3.16. I bow my knee before the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you, I'm praying this now for you, he may grant you by his spirit to be strengthened in the inner man with power, and that Christ might dwell in your heart through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded, may have power to comprehend what is the height and depth and length and breadth, and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge and be filled with all the fullness of God. Keswick did not overstate the goal. Any view of the Christian life that does not promote desire for and pursuit of that inexpressible fullness is as defective as a view that says it always comes through a crisis experience sometime after your conversion. In fact, I would say more defective. It's less defective to pursue it in a wrong way than not to pursue it. 
The link between Hudson Taylor's pursuit of this fullness and the legacy of the China Inland Mission is enormously instructive. It is relevant for everyone who wants to experience peace that passes understanding and who wants your life to bear fruit all out of proportion to your limitations. And that's what I hope will happen as a result of this message. You will be led by his example and the Holy Spirit in this room into a deeper experience of union with Christ experientially, and you will venture more for his glory than you've ever ventured before in your, your situation or beyond your situation. Do a little survey here. If you're uh, 29 years old or younger, raise your hand. Okay, so those are our 20-somethings and younger. If you're between 30 and 50, raise your hand. That's probably more. And then over 50, like me. Interesting. That's great. Now, the reason I had you do that is because I have, I have the young guys in mind, and they're just getting started. They're dreaming their dreams. They're maybe in their first church or ministry. And then there's the midlife folks who are cresting and and some of you in crisis. Happens to a lot of guys around 41 and a half. And, And then there's the rest of us who the world talks in terms of sunset years. (laughs) I think that's terrible (laughs) because it's unbiblical. Proverbs 4, verse 18 says, the life of the righteous is like the dawn that grows brighter and brighter until the full day. Stop. No sunset. (laughs) Noon. Death is 11.59 a.m. So so my, my point here is that, yes, young man, yes, get beyond that midlife crisis. Yes, you 50, 60, 70 somethings. There is a dream to be dreamed. There is more. There is more in Christ for now. And of course, the resurrection. 12 o'clock is resurrection. Noon, not midnight. When Hudson Taylor wrote one of his most famous sayings, depend upon it. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supplies. He meant every kind of supply. Money, health, faith, peace, strength, protection. And that's my prayer, that you will see and experience new possibilities of spiritual experience. You've been frustrated a long time. He was. New possibilities for spiritual experience, new victories, more faith, more joy, more peace, more love, and all the money you need to do his will, which may mean none or much. My God will supply all your needs means to do his will. And we die as part of his will. We suffer as part of his will. And we need several millions of dollars to do desiring God and to your church has a budget and you need a salary and you can send your kids to school and We all know these things, and this promise is true. He will not leave you without what you need to do his will. He won't make you rich. God forbid. It's hard for rich people to get into the kingdom. Why would you want that? Why would you want to make it hard? My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus was one of his favorite texts. 
And because of that new peace, that new confidence, new supply, you then venture everything on your dream, your Christ-exalting dream that maybe God is birthing in these very days as you're away from home. Sometimes it happens like that. Abiding in Christ produced in Hudson Taylor a life of great action. Risk, discipline, self-denial, all of it sustained by great peace, great joy, and that's what my prayer is for us here now. Unlike Robert and Hannah Smith, two of the great founding thinkers, writers of the Keswick movement, unlike them, Hudson never made shipwreck of his faith. They did. From his conversion, age 17, to his death, age 73, 1905, he was unwavering in his allegiance to Jesus Christ and Christ's purpose to evangelize the provinces of China. Whatever his views of the Christian life, They stood him well. They served him well. And the legacy of steadfast faith and obedience and fruitfulness is astonishing. He he did not have a flashy second experience and then crash, which thousands have. He did have an experience. We'll talk about it. And he proved him or and or. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him or and or. Yes, he did. And so his life is worth looking at. He was born May 21st, 1832 in Barnsley, England, to a devout Methodist home. Age 17, he was dramatically converted Uh, He was a good friend of Spurgeon, and Spurgeon told the whole story. This is a very well-known story about his conversion. I'm just going to let you you find it and read it. It was dramatic because of his mother's prayers for him, sort of like Augustine. He entered then immediately a rudimentary medical training with an apprenticeship to Robert Hardy, no formal Theological training, no formal medical training, and at age 21, September 19, 1853, he was on a boat headed for China with the China Evangelistic Society. Landed in Shanghai March 1st after a a five-and-a-half-month voyage. He learned the language quickly. In his first two years, he did 10 upcountry evangelistic trips, risking his life over and over again to just herald the gospel in the streets where they've never been preached before and there were no churches and no Christians. After four years, he resigned from the China Evangelistic Society because of a deep conviction that neither a person nor an agency should ever borrow money. Here's what he said. To borrow money implied, to my mind, a contradiction of Scripture, a confession that God had withheld some good thing, which he never does, and a determination to get for ourselves what he had not given To satisfy my conscience, I was therefore compelled to resign the connection with the society which had hitherto supplied my salary. That was the beginning of an approach to missions that was called faith missions, and he, from then on, never went into debt personally and never went into debt as the China Inland Mission, which he would later found nor would he ever ask for money explicitly. He would follow his hero, George Mueller, who was alive at the time. January 20th, 1858, he had been in China almost five years. He married Maria Dyer. They were married for 12 years. Maria died when she was 
33. She had given birth to eight children. Two of them died at birth, two died in childhood, and four lived. And all four of those children became missionaries with the China Inland Mission that their father had founded. I really did have to pause there and wonder. He sent those children back to England when they were six. And there are really painful descriptions of a little six-year-old boy weeping his way onto the boat as mommy's left behind. And today we would look at that and say, hmm, not sure about that. God saved them all and put them all right back into their father's mission. That's amazing. Be careful. Be careful how you judge people's handling on the mission field of their children. Be careful. It's not easy. And frankly, I would be very slow to condemn almost any approach that keeps a person on the field if they're called. It's worth thinking about. July 1860, Hudson and Maria sailed for England. He was seriously ill with hepatitis. It was, in his mind, a terrible setback to have to go back to England. And this setback, so-called, would give rise to the most important or one of the two most important events of his life, namely the founding of the China Inland Mission. He was home for four years, and uh, during the, the very period that it took the Americans to fight the Civil War, he was birthing a vision that would transform the largest nation in the world. He knew there needed to be another agency that functioned on different principles. He did not know he could lead it. He was very fearful about whether he had the strength, the wisdom, the wherewithal to lead a mission that would penetrate all the provinces of China. The decisive day came in June 25, 1865, Brighton Beach, England, and I'll let him describe it for you. On Sunday, June 25th, 1865, unable to bear the sight of a congregation of a thousand or more Christian people rejoicing in their own security while millions were perishing for lack of knowledge, I wandered out on the sands alone in great spiritual agony. And there the Lord conquered my unbelief, and I surrendered myself to God for this service, for this service. I told him that all the responsibility as to issues and consequences must rest with him, that as his servant, it was mine to obey and to follow him, his to direct, to care for and to guide me and those who might labor with me. Need I say that peace at once flowed into my burdened heart? There and then I asked him for 24 fellow workers, two for each of the 11 inland provinces which were without a missionary, and two for Mongolia, and writing the petition on the margin in the Bible I had with me, I returned home with a heart enjoying rest such as had been, I had been a stranger to for months. Isn't it beautiful to watch the birth of a world-changing event? He was 33 years old. Some of you are 33. Jesus finished at 33. He was just beginning. The missionaries would have no guaranteed salaries. These are the stipulations now of how they would run this mission. They would have no guaranteed salaries. They were not to appeal for funds to anyone except God. They were to adopt Chinese dress, which was very controversial at the time, pigtail and all, and press the gospel to the interior. That was their, their goals. May 26, the following year, 1866, Hudson and Maria and their children 
and the largest group of missionaries ever to sail to China, so far, 16 besides themselves, were on a boat sailing for China with Hudson Taylor as the leader who would decide all issues. I say that because sometimes when we read biography and we have our heroes, we, we miss the horrific controversies they endured and and this was one of them. He was quite a, a, a strong leader, and the pressures he put on himself spiritually and in terms of evangelism, he put on others, and this didn't land well with all of them, and one of these 16 accused him of tyranny and had to be dismissed and sent back to England. That was not easy, and there were other such things. Three years later, after prolonged frustration with his own temptations and failures in holiness, failures in holiness, a second epoch-making event happened, namely the spiritual crisis that caused him to be associated with the Keswick movement. And we'll come back to that in a few moments, but what I want you to see now is what he was experiencing leading up to it. This is a quote. The need for your prayer has never been greater than at present. Envied by some, despised by many, hated by others, often blamed for things I never had anything to do with, an innovator on what uh, have become established missionary practices, an opponent of mighty systems of heathen error and superstition, working without precedent in many respects and with few experienced helpers, often sick in body as well as perplexed in mind and embarrassed by circumstances. Had not the Lord been specially gracious to me, had not my mind been sustained by the conviction that the work is his, and that he is with me, I must have fainted or broken down. But the battle is the Lord's, and he will conquer. We may fail, do fail continually, but he never fails. I have continually to mourn that I follow at such a distance and learn so slowly to imitate my precious master. I cannot tell you how I am buffeted sometimes by temptation. He's writing to his mother. I never knew how bad my heart is. Yet, I do know that I love God and love his work and desire to serve him only and in all things. And I value above all else that precious Savior in whom alone I can be accepted. But often, I am tempted to think that One so full of sin cannot be a child of God at all. May God help me to love him more and serve him better. So you can see he's ripe. He's ripe for a critical intervention from God. September 4, 1869. Shengjiang, he enters a new Christian experience. Oh, Mr. Judd, God has made me a new man. God has made me a new man. What happened on that day, September 4, was not ephemeral. He looked back 30 years later and wrote this. We shall never forget the blessing we received from the words of John 4, 14. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Nearly 30 years ago, as we realized that Christ literally meant what he said, shall meant shall, never meant never, thirst meant thirst, our heart overflowed with joy as we accepted the gift 
Oh, the thirst with which we had sat down, and oh, the joy with which we sprang out of our seat, praising the Lord, that the thirsting days were all past, past forever. Now, before you respond cynically to that, he's not naive. He's writing that 30 years later. He's, he's speaking of an experience that didn't leave him crashing and burning after a high at a conference. The thirsting days were all past does not mean in his mouth he never had any desires for Jesus anymore. They don't mean that he didn't walk through horrific days of pressure and a sense of desolation at times. What they did mean, we'll get to shortly. But be careful, lest when you read those kinds of things, you just write them off as Keswick overstatements of flashy spiritual experiences that peter out in the end and leave Christians worse off than, than before. His most thorough biographer, six volumes, Broom Hall, said his life was revolutionized by this day. And just in time, because the next year, 1870, was the worst year of his life. God knows what he's doing. His son Samuel died in January of 1870. And then in July, Maria gave birth to a son, Noel, and the boy died two weeks later because she was so weak she couldn't nurse him. And then Maria, at age 33, died. Two sons and a wife of 12 years in a stretch of months. In one year, they had four living children remaining, small children, and Hudson Taylor at 38. A year later, Taylor sailed for England and recovered and married again, 1871, to Jenny. They lived together for 33 years. She almost lived. To the end with him, she died in 1904. He died in 1905. They had a son and a daughter, so now there are six children living. She stayed in England at one stretch. I mention this just to show the kinds of things they had to live with in those days. She stayed in England from 1881 to 1890 while he made two trips to China, and I calculate they were apart for six years total. In his lifetime, Hudson Taylor made 10 voyages to China, which means, as I reckon the sum, he spent between five and six years on the water. <laughs> Just in case you have a two-hour delay at the airport today. <laughs> <laughs> this is a life about not murmuring about the peace of God that passes all understanding he was the general director from 1865 when he founded it right in Beach to 1902 three years before he died when he handed it off to Dixon Hosta. And all those trips, all those long voyages, four, five, six months at a time, one way and the other way, so 10 times you do the math like I did, all that travel is just a beautiful example of, here's the pilgrim here. We're a pilgrim. You get stuck in an airport, just think, tent, it's a tent, you know, I I, I shouldn't have a home anyway. I don't even live here. I'm just traveling through. 
quite a symbol. He lived to see the horrible Boxer Rebellion in 1900. And I mention it because he was the director when this happened. The Boxer Rebellion was an uprising where all foreigners, especially Christians, were targeted with great rage. And China Inland Mission lost more missionaries than any other mission under his watch. 58 adults were slaughtered. 21 children were killed in 1900. And the next year, when the Allied nations moved in and demanded recompense for the losses of property and people, Hudson Taylor and the China Inland Mission did not demand any payment because he wanted to win them and not just get justice from them. February 1905, Hudson Taylor sailed for China for the last time. He did a little tour with his son and daughter-in-law through the various mission stations, and then he died in Hunan at age 73. And was buried beside his first wife and four children. Jenny had uh, died the year before in Switzerland. So she's buried in Switzerland. He's buried in China. Another pilgrim reality. Where are you going to want to be buried? You know, it doesn't really matter. The Cultural Revolution destroyed the cemetery today. There are industrial buildings on top of it. At the time of his death, the China Inland Mission was an international body of 825 missionaries, 18 provinces of China, 300 mission stations, 500 local Chinese helpers, 25,000 converts, Luminaries that came up in the China Inland Mission were people like the Cambridge Seven, William Borden, James Fraser, John and Betty Stam. Today, there are 1,600 missionaries with OMF International, which is the new name, led in Singapore by a Chinese. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you love for whatever little efforts you made here to see in 150 years, it's still going. It's still going. The, the mission statement of the OMF International is to glorify God by the urgent evangelization of East Asia millions. Their, their vision statement is, through God's grace, we aim to see an indigenous Biblical church movement in each people group of East Asia evangelizing their own people and reaching out in uh, mission to other peoples. That's an absolutely audacious mission statement. And he would be so pleased. He would be so pleased. Next year, 2015, will mark the 150th anniversary of the mission that Hudson Taylor founded. In 1900, there were 100,000 Christians in China. Today, 150,000, maybe. I mean, million. <laughs> 150 million. Picking the middle number, and you can go to the footnote that I have here when you read this online to see how that's calculated. This is God's work. One plants, another waters. God gives the growth. Nevertheless, it's the fruit of faithful labor. It's the fruit of faithful labor. People don't get saved without hearing the gospel. And he worked longer and harder than most. And he was sustained by union with Christ. Abiding in Christ. So that's where we turn now. September 4, 1869, 37 years old, found a letter on the table in Zhengzheng from John McCarthy, a fellow missionary. 
God used that letter to revolutionize Hudson Taylor's life. When my agony of soul was at its height, a sentence in a letter from dear McCarthy was used to remove the scales from my eyes. And the Spirit of God revealed to me the truth of our oneness with Jesus as I had never known it before. Now notice some things from that sentence. That's, that's a very important sentence. Notice some things. He was not changed by new information. Taylor knew his Bible. Good night, he read his Bible faithfully from 17 to 37. He knew his Bible. He knew Keswick teaching. That year, uh, 1869, Robert Pearsall Smith, the guy who totally made shipwreck of his faith, nevertheless was writing on the higher life in Revival Magazine, was being read by all the missionaries in the China Inland Mission. That, that six months before this happened, he had read those articles. All the missionaries were reading those articles. Those articles are the ones who caused McCarthy to have an experience that caused him to write the letter that Hudson read that caused him to have this experience. So there's no new information going on here. We've all experienced this. You know something. You've read this book hundreds of times. A book, a verse in John 15 or Philippians 4. And one day, maybe you've just lost your daughter, son, wife. The doctors just told you you have cancer. And the verse explodes. With glory. You wonder, what, why didn't this happen before? God is God. So this is not unusual. We've all had this kind of scale lifting. The Spirit of God revealed to me the truth of our oneness with Jesus as I had never known it before. He knew it. And now he knows it better, different, more power, more deep, more thorough, more high, more lasting, more. That's, that's what he's saying. As I have never known it before. He knew it before, and then he says the Holy Spirit just gave him new eyes. And that's exactly the way he understood it. He understood it, he said so repeatedly in terms of Ephesians 1.18. Paul prays that the eyes of your heart, your Christian heart, your Christian heart, your born-again heart, your Christ-indwelt heart, that the eyes of your hearts would be enlightened that you would know. No, you know. You already know. No, you don't already know, as you might know. That's what he's praying. You know your hope. You know your inheritance. You know the power that raised Jesus from the dead. You know. You don't know. As you might know, if you did, he wouldn't pray that. He's praying for Christians. He knows then, we know now, there's more. We all live at levels that are disappointing to ourselves. All of us. As I read this letter from McCarthy, I saw it all. I looked to Jesus and saw, and when I saw, oh, how joy flowed, that he had said, I will never leave thee. I saw not only that Jesus will never leave me, but that I 
am a member of his body. Like, really? This is not new information. I saw that I was a member of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. The vine is not the root merely, but the all, root, stem, branches, twigs, leaves, flowers, fruit. And Jesus is not that alone. He is soil and sunshine and air and flowers and 10,000 times more than we have ever dreamed, wished, or needed. Oh, the joy of seeing this truth. So you can see what happened. He just saw like he'd never seen before. It was a miracle of eyes of the heart being opened to a deeper level of taste of union with Christ. The sweetest part, he said, if one may speak of one part being sweeter than another, is the rest which full identification with Christ brings. The experience came to be known as the exchanged life. So you read biography after biography, and they all have a chapter called the exchanged life. And that comes from Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And then If you think Keswick people overstate things, Paul just said, no longer I who lives, and now he says, the life I now live. I live by faith in this indwelling Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the experience that just exploded for him. And along with the new sight, of Christ's fullness and his union with Christ, there was a new yieldedness. Quote, surrender to Christ he had long known. This is from his son writing about him. Surrender to Christ he had long known, but this was more. This was a new yieldedness, a glad, unreserved handing over of self and everything to him. This new yieldedness was so powerful, so sweet, so supernatural, that it it rose up like an indictment of all of his vain strivings to have it. When you have been swept up into the arms of Jesus... All previous efforts to jump in seem vain. At the heart of the discovery was the full fruit of the vine, abiding, not striving, he said. At the heart of the discovery, was that this fruit comes from abiding, not striving. Here's what he said. This is typical Keswick language now, of which we must be careful. And he will be told so by his fellow worker. To let my loving Savior work in me, his will, let him, let him work in me, his will, my sanctification, is what I would live for by his grace. Abiding, not striving, not struggling, looking off unto him, trusting him for present power, resting in the love of an almighty Savior. Now that consciousness of resting was the spring from which power came. Let then, he said, let us not Seek, let us not wait, let us not pursue, but accept by the Savior's word, ye are branches. Now, I remember the days when I used to read things like that, and I would just scoff. 
I'd say, but the Bible says seek, the Bible says ask, the Bible says pursue unbiblical next book. I don't, I'm not so quick anymore. After, after watching his life and after seeing his testimony from the end, he's not stupid. He knows that's what the Bible says. So I asked myself last night, as this, this is a new little section from last night. I asked myself, okay, suppose I'm hungry for a greater portion of peace, a greater portion of tenderness, a greater portion of kindness, a greater portion of sweet enjoyment of Jesus with total authenticity and not watching myself enjoy, but just enjoying. Suppose I get on my knees and I'm going to give five minutes of prayer to seeking this, waiting for this, pursuing this. Now, If I were on my knees and Hudson Taylor saw me there pleading for five minutes for that, I don't think he would criticize me. But suppose the Savior at minute four and a half of my pleading walks up to me with a tray and on it is called peace, kindness, gentleness, enjoyment of me with authenticity, what you've been asking for. And he goes like this. And I say, oh, God, give it to him, please. I pray. Amen. I turn it, walk right by the tray, and I go over to my computer and start working on my message. This message. Do you think that might be what Hudson Taylor means when he says, stop seeking. Stop Waiting, stop pursuing, accept. I mean, what is faith? I mean, what is that last moment of the connection of an answered prayer? What's it like? Isn't it like, okay, off the track, take. And isn't there in some of us a sense that he never answers my prayers? I'm supposed to pray. I'm going to pray. And now I'm done. And maybe while I'm working on this message, something will happen to me. That's what I think he probably would say if he were watching me and I stood up and the tray were in front of me called, you are my branches. I am your savior, your love, your bread, your life. I am all What is it going to take? He would say, resting, abiding, enjoying, receiving. And I'm not spanking you because this is a miracle. Act the miracle. Act the miracle. Receive. You've got to work this through, guys. You've got to work this through. There's, There's... There's more here than cynics see. Work, he said, is the outcome of effort. Fruit is the outcome of life. A bad man may do good work, but a bad tree can't bear good fruit. How to get faith strengthened? Not by striving after faith, but by resting on the faithful one. Now, I know this problem was that. We're coming. We're coming. But before we just write him off, I'm pleading with you to think this through. Unlike many who claim the higher life experience, Hudson Taylor, Hudson's didn't, his experience didn't let him down. He, had, he reached a plane of joy and a plane of peace and a plane of strength that lasted all his life. It had its ups and downs, but something had happened, and the ups and downs were higher than the ups and downs were before. Before turning 60, just before turning 60, he was in Melbourne. An Episcopalian minister had heard of Keswick 
and was spending time with Hudson, and he wrote this. Here was the real thing, an embodiment of what Keswick teaches, such as I had never hoped to see. He's 60 years old. Such as I had never hoped to see. It impressed me profoundly. He was a man almost 60 years of age, bearing tremendous burdens, yet absolutely calm and untroubled. So here's my closing question, to which I have three answers. So we got another 10, 15 minutes to go. Why did it last? Thousands have had Keswick experiences and crashed and burned. They've gone to conferences on union, abiding. God has met them. They soared and they crashed. Why didn't he? And I mentioned three answers. I'm going to unpack those three answers. I didn't think them up and then look for them. I was done with all my research and there they were. Number one, he was a Bible man, absolutely saturated with the Bible. He, he knew all the criticisms and to what degree they were biblical. Number two, he suffered. Oh, how he suffered. And number three, he believed in the sovereignty of the vine dresser. Okay, let's take those one at a time. He was a Bible guy. He was submissive. Not just a knower of the Bible. He was submissive to the Bible. There's the key. You can be a knower of the Bible and crash and burn and make shipwreck of your faith. To be submissive to the Bible is a wonderful protection from crashing and burning. His walk of faith in life was not nearly as passive as some of his words make it out to be. William Berger, his uh, England side, China Inland Mission leader, when he read the correspondence in which Hudson Taylor described his experience, wrote to him a warning letter saying how he disapproved of overstressing the passive, receptive aspects of holiness and minimizing the active. And he emphasized, we must resist evil. We must make efforts to obey God. And, and later, J.C. Ryle, in the same period, would write the famous book on holiness precisely to try to set things more straight when it came to the way God sanctifies his people. Over the years, Taylor embraced that counsel. He accepted that. I don't think it was a surprise in his ears that he needed to be warned against overstressing the passive at the exclusion of the active. He said, union is not identical with abiding. Union is uninterrupted. Abiding may be interrupted. If abiding be interrupted, sin follows. That's true. He not only recognized that abiding in Christ can be interrupted and has its ups and downs, but that even our most faith-filled, joy-filled, ecstatic moments of abiding are sinful. Not all Keswick people went there. We are sinful creatures, he wrote, and our holiest service can only be accepted through Christ Jesus, our Lord. What a safeguard against perfectionism. His life was one resounding affirmation. God uses means to preserve and deepen and intensify union with Christ. And those means are a kind of effort. He would say, not slavish effort, but trusting effort. The difference between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. The difference between serving in your own strength and 1 Peter 4.11. Let him who serves serve in the strength that God supplies. What's that like? 
That should be one of your major goals in life is to discover the meaning of 1 Peter 4.11 for ministry. Serving in the strength of another. You serve, the strength is from another. That's the miracle of life. That's what he discovered in a new way. Or Galatians 2.20, the life I now live. Yes, I get out of bed in the morning. I go and open my Bible. I write mission letters. I edit a magazine. I recruit recruits by the faith of him who loved me and gave himself for me so that I'm walking in constant reliance and communion upon him a moment by moment so that there's this sweet peace and contentment in my effort. In this effort of faith, there are things to be done. Quote, communion with Christ requires our coming to him, meditating upon his person, and his work requires the diligent use of the means of grace, and especially prayerful reading of his word. Many fail to abide because they habitually fast instead of feed. Ask from the word instead of feeding on the word. His new pattern after his experience was to get up, go to bed earlier, get up at 5 a.m. He knew he needed sleep. That's another means of grace. He got up at 5 a.m. in order to, quote, give time to Bible study and prayer, often two hours before the work of the day began. And he never saw these spiritual disciplines in contradiction to glorious experience of union with Christ. Jesus is the vine, his father is the vine dresser, both the power of the vine and the providence of the vine dresser, including the vine dresser's providence to get you out of bed in the morning, get you over your Bible, open your eyes, use caffeine if you must, and keep you reading in his holy word. This leads now to the second reason why he didn't make shipwreck. First one was he's Bible saturated. He, he, he walked into a biblical balance concerning means and effort, and yet he never, ever forsook the wonder of the sweetness and quietness and restfulness, peacefulness, joyfulness of abiding like a branch in a vine in all of his efforts. That's what we want. Second, he suffered deep. And long, and this suffering was God's way of deepening and sweetening his experience of union with Christ. The vine dresser does many things to the branches, and the one that Jesus focused on in John 15 too was pruning, cutting. The aim of that cutting is to preserve and intensify, make fruitful the vine. So here's what he says, it is only, this is Hudson Taylor, it is only in the trial of God's grace that its beauty and power can be seen. Then all our trials of temper, circumstances, provocation, sickness, disappointment, bereavement will but give a higher burnish to the mirror and enable us to reflect more fully, more perfectly, the glory and blessedness of our master. Another quote. It is in the path of obedience and self-denying service that God reveals himself most intimately to his children. When it costs most, we find the greatest joy. We find the darkest hours. We find the darkest hours, the brightest and the greatest loss, the highest gain. While the sorrow is short-lived and will soon pass away, the joy is far more exceeding and it is eternal. Would that I could give you an idea of the way in which God has revealed himself to me in China and to others whom I have known in the presence of bereavement In the deepest sorrows of life, he has so drawn near to me that I have said to myself, is it possible that the precious one who is in his presence can have more of his presence than I have now? 
In other words, the experience of the fullness of union with all of its joy, peace, power, love, comes not only from the preciousness of the vine, but the pruning of the vine dress. God uses means of pain as well as prayer and Bible study. Quote, all these difficulties, Taylor said, are only platforms for the manifestation of his grace and power and love, which leads us finally now to number three. He rested in, believed in the sovereignty of God in a very absolute way. I had to dig for this. It's funny how biographers of Hudson Taylor are so ah theological. Very frustrating. But I dug and I found. Because I wondered. How did he retain his composure when 58 of his missionaries were slaughtered? 21 children killed. How did he retain, under the most oppressive, dangerous, sorrowful, painful circumstances, his joy? How did he keep going? How did he not just throw in the towel and say, it's enough, I can't take it anymore? He did it because he was sure of the all-satisfying sap of the vine and the all-satisfying sovereignty of the vine dresser. When he was 52, he was laid up, and he wrote, make up your mind that God is an infinite sovereign and has the right to do as he pleases with his own, and he may not explain to you a thousand things which may puzzle your reason in his dealings with you. When Maria died... He was 38, four little children left behind. She died of cholera. He wrote to his mother, from my inmost soul, this is the year after the experience happened, from my inmost soul, I delight in the knowledge that God does and permits all things and causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. Now, Satan is real, and he does much evil in the world to God's people. Job is written to help us grasp how the sovereignty of God relates to that evil of Satan, and his reflections on the book of Job are stunning. He wrote, oftentimes shall we be helped and blessed if we bear in mind that Satan is servant and not master, and that he and wicked men incited by him are only permitted to do that which God, by his determinate counsel and foreknowledge, has before determined shall come. People use the word permit sometimes to escape determinate counsel. Hudson didn't. God ordains or permits all that comes to pass. And when he unpacks permits, he unpacks it by saying, they are only permitted to do what God, by his determinate counsel and foreknowledge, has before determined shall be done. Paraphrase. God permits what he decrees. Conclusion. I conclude that while Keswick teaching may in many cases have been overemphasized or have overemphasized passivity. That's true. In many cases, overemphasize the essential nature of a second experience of a crisis nature that you must walk into and out of to get to the higher life. That's not true. You don't have to go that route. So that's a mistake to overemphasize that 
second experience while they were mistaken in the worst exponents of emphasis on passivity or a second experience. Nevertheless, Hudson Taylor's life bears witness to the possibility of living with more peace, more joy, more fruit in hardship than most of us enjoy. If you just need Bible to meditate on in the coming days, go here. You know where I'm quoting. Not that I speak of being in need, for I have learned, mark that word, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret. It's a hopox legomenon in the New Testament. Greek word only used here. A word almost always used in the mystery religions for the secret. Why would he grasp for a word like that? That's a risky word. Because it's a mystery how you, how you learn the secret. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if you just need to take away a Bible verse to pray over, let it be Philippians 4, 11 to 14. The learning here, I believe in this text, when Paul says, I have learned this, contentment, this murmur-free contentment. Oh, I'd love to unpack that. <sighs> Chapter 2, verse 15, do all things without grumbling or complaining, questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God in the midst of crooked and perverse generations. I'm going to you shine in China like the light of the world. What's the light of the world? Murmur-free. Christians who don't complain is the light of the world. It's the same light in chapter 5 of Matthew as well. Blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Rejoice, don't complain. Rejoice in that day, for great is your reward in heaven. Let them see this glory of your good works so that they may give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We have such a long way to go. John Piper does at least. 68 and still murmuring. Pray for me. I will pray for you. I am totally serious. Learning is, two more minutes. Learning is information and realization. Information is, we have a vine. We're attached to a vine. He is life. He is all. My joy I give to you. My peace I give to you. My love I give to you. This is information that's right there in the book. Attached to the vine by faith in Jesus. It's ours. Union is unbreakable, unchangeable. Realization is a miracle, a miracle. It's always faith. Realization of the fullness of this experience is a miracle and is a resting, is a receiving, is an enjoying. It happens. It happens or it doesn't while you're contemplating the union and the wonder of the vine and his life in you. So whether God gives you a crisis moment, I don't idolize that. I've never experienced one, I don't think. I probably experienced several of them, but I don't remember them because I'm 68. 
Whether you have a crisis moment of this realization that lasts a lifetime, or whether God leads you into deeper, higher experiences of himself over time through many warfare battles, don't settle. Don't settle for anything less than murmur-free contentment in the vine that unleashes your dream, your venture. When you're leaving here in in a couple hours, have before you, may I be filled with all the fullness of God, Ephesians 3, 19, and don't settle till your noontime, noontime. Don't settle till noon till you get it. You will get it. Just question how much of you get now. And God only knows how much he will give to you now. Some people labor with psychological uh, woundedness to the end. And they hold on and that's a beautiful thing. He is honored by that holding on. But don't ever, ever think that there's not more for you to have. And then when you have it, whatever measure... Use it to give yourself to some amazing, Christ-exalting dream. Let's pray. So, Father, some of these, some of these brothers, sisters here are, are going to go to China. Going to go to North Korea. They're going to go to Indonesia. They're going to go to Iraq or Saudi Arabia. And I pray that you would just make that clear for them without any arm twisting, may the peace of God rule, arbitrate, confirm in their hearts what the next venture is. And may for all of us, Lord, there be a higher level of enjoyment of our union with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.